All right, let's get started. Got a lot of material to cover today. A support group entitled Make Today Count met at a local hospital. The group consists of people who had life-threatening uh, diseases. Addie, would you like to give me that clicker? I forgot that. Got too many technology items to be remembering. Thank you. Uh, let me start over. A support group entitled Make Today Count met at a local hospital and the group consists of people who had life-threatening diseases. In one such meeting, an elderly person, a handsome gray-haired woman with a broad uh, face of, uh, of an European immigrant was present and she spoke with uh, simple declarative statements with a heavy brogue and she expressed her loneliness. The group asked if she had any family and she replied that she had one son that was in the Air Force in Germany and he was trying to get an emergency leave. She swallowed hard a few times and then said uh, that uh, in response to the question, someone asked, uh, in your husband, and, and, and she swallowed hard, and, and she said, well, he, he came to see me just once. I was in the hospital. He, he brought me my bathrobe and a few things. The doctor stood in the hallway and told him about my leukemia. Her voice began to crack, and she dabbled at her eyes before continuing, and she said, he went home that night, packed up all of his things and left. I've never saw him again. There was a long pause and someone asked, how long were you married? And her simple reply was, 37 years. That story was a true story taken from the book of uh, Philip Yancey's and its title, the title of the book is a question that many ask in face of suffering. The title is, Where is God When It Hurts? Uh, I, I've chosen that story as an introduction to our series that we will be embarking uh, this morning. Uh, with the board's uh, approval, I, I chose to do a series on the book of Job, which deals with suffering, or as I sometimes refer to it as, life's reversals. Never know what a day brings. Your life can be reversed very quickly. I anticipate that we'll be spending probably uh, four, maybe five Sundays on this topic. And perhaps it's your habit to bring a Bible along each Sunday, but I really do encourage you the next couple of weeks to take your Bibles as we'll be covering a lot of material and perhaps not everything will be listed on the screen for your viewing. As to the book itself, historically it was one of the first of writings. Uh, it occurred uh, during very early in human history. The storyline in the book of Job is found in the first two chapters and then it goes to the last chapter. Everything else is a series of speeches. The issues that Job and his friends talk about are life and death ones. And as you read through the speeches of Job's friends, you need to remember that their views do not necessarily reflect God's. Uh, the book of Job merely records what the friends uh, said in their viewpoints. The book of Job reads like a detective story. Why? Uh, because the readers know far more about what's occurring than the central characters do. You see the reader when he begins to start the very first question is answered. The question is uh, had Job done anything wrong to deserve suffering? And the reader knows the answer to that in the very first chapter. No, he didn't do anything wrong. We the readers know that but nobody tells Job or his friends throughout the entire story. So this morning's message will deal with the first chapter and it's important for us to go and look at the historical uh, narrative and so we'll be dealing with this entire first chapter to uh, 
lay the foundational uh, structure of our study. And so as to the order of our service this morning, it'll follow this pattern. First, I'd, I'd like to spend uh, some time looking at reasons why we'll be studying the book of Job. If we're going to take four or five weeks uh, to study, it, it, it might be important to stop and reflect why. Why are we going to look at the book of Job? We'll look at five reasons. Uh, then we'll move into the text itself and, and, and we'll look at what happened on earth. And then we will look at what happened in heaven prior to the events that occurred on earth. And lastly, we'll look at Job's response to the event. Nobody suffered more. Nobody deserved it less. Let's begin. Let's, let's begin by looking at the five reasons to study the book of Job. The first reason is to assist you in maintaining a vital dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. That's my first objective, is to assist you in maintaining your relationship, the dynamics of it, with Jesus Christ. You see, suffering or life's reversals can have a huge impact upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. The impact can either be negative, but it can be positive as well. A critic to the study of Job might say, well, wouldn't speaking on prosperity uh, be more positive? <laughs> well, understandably, prosperity is, is, is a very appealing topic, isn't it? But even prosperity, despite its appealing nature, can have a huge impact on your relationship to Jesus Christ, and it can have a huge negative impact. You recall the writer in Proverbs said, uh, in Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9, he says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Prosperity can drive you away. It can be negative and it can be positive to your relationship. But it's the relationship that's the important aspect, isn't it? Likewise, suffering... Our life's reversals can either have a negative or a positive effect as well. I have seen folk and met folk who have been touched by life's reversals and it has enhanced their relationship to Jesus Christ in a very unique way. And conversely, I have seen folk in my ministry who have rejected God because of their suffering. For example, they might watch a loved one suffer and die, and their response to the death of that loved one is that they reject God and drop out of church attendance. I have seen scenarios like that numerous times. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ that is paramount. That is of most importance, and that's what we'll be dealing with. And remember, the chief aim of man is to glorify God. The relationship to Jesus then is way more important than your increase or decrease of possessions. A second reason to study the book of Job is that many people suffer and have questions. They look for questions. You know, to the Marxists, to the humanists, to the Buddhists, suffering's just as painful to them as it is for us Christians. But they're not haunted with one question. They're not haunted with one piercing question, and that is, in the midst of suffering, is there something wrong between God and me? Oftentimes, when we suffer, we ask that question. People can respond in various ways to that question. Some might have guilt, some might have indecision, some might have anger, all kinds of responses. How is it possible that God lets these things happen, folk would ask. And then they would argue, if he's a source of pain and suffering, then he cannot be all loving. Or they would argue, if he's not able to avert evil, he cannot be all-powerful. How reliable is God? How fair is he? And ultimately they ask, is he of any use to me? Those are typical questions, and the book of Job will address 
some of those questions, if not all. It's a complex book, though. A third reason to study the book of Job is because of the sovereignty of God. In our society, many question the sovereignty of God. What happens after a major earthquake? What will you hear on the news? Where is God? As if it's his fault. Where is God? You hear it from newspapers and on television and on the radio after major events. And even Christians can question the sovereignty of God by making statements like, well, God would not want you to be financially challenged or God would not want you to be sick or handicapped. Job speaks strongly to the issue of the sovereignty of God. Satan meant it for evil, God meant it for good. That's the sovereignty of God, and it's another reason why we will be studying the book of Job. A fourth reason has to do with persecution. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it reads... You, however, know all about my preaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. And then it continues by saying, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, and I want you to pay attention to verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what Paul says. If you want to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted according to Scripture. Christians from the Anabaptist movement, such as the Mennonites, have a long history of serving the Lord, and they know this verse is true. What is persecution? What is persecution? Well, by definition, it is the righteous suffering unjustly. Job deals with that topic precisely. We Americans have enjoyed a long history of religious freedom. But my friends, the season's changing. There's a chill in the air, like the first day of fall. And even this week, there was a chill in the air. Iran and Saudi Arabia ratcheted up. North Korea flexed their muscles. And our financial markets are nervous. And above all, we continue to hear about persecution coming out of the Middle East. And the climate is beginning to change in our country as well. Are you aware that persecution is a divinely appointed way to spread the gospel? You need only look at the end of the book of John where Jesus says to Peter, What is it to you? I will show him by what death he will glorify me this event of persecution would result in death and a spreading of the gospel, he's implying. You see, God just doesn't use an event after the fact in order to do something good. He structures the event in advance to meet his objective. China and Iran have been known historically for their persecution, and they have some of the fastest growing churches in the world. There's something about persecution that makes a Christian serious about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Another reason to study the book of Job. A fifth reason to study the book of Job is because suffering is a universal phenomenon. Many of us have suffered already. And if you haven't, you likely will. Because there's not two classes of people. There's not one class that suffers and another that doesn't suffer. We all suffer at times with different intensity, with different levels, certainly. But it is a universal phenomenon. The fact that we all experience reversals is why there's an insurance industry designed to help us with the financial aspects of reversals. Job helps us with the spiritual aspects of reversals. The fact that all suffer is shown in Acts 14, 22, where it reads, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to 
remain true to the faith, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That is the nature of the beast. That's the nature of the Christian walk. And Acts 14 says, talks about being strengthened and encouraged to remain true in face of this reality. Job helps strengthen and encourage the believer in the face of this universal phenomenon. It, a matter of fact, is the main book that deals with this issue directly. So, let, let's turn our attention to the text itself this morning. Job is the main character. He will be treated like a real man, not merely a literary creation like some liberals would point to. The spiritual struggles and bitterness that he comes out of his soul is expressed and can only be expressed by an individual that is experiencing these trials and is showing his humanity. Who, who was Job? Who was the man Job? Ironically, he probably was an Edomite. You see, the Edomites lived southeast of Israel. And it is said that Job was from the land of Uz. Did I pronounce that right? Uz, I think. And according to uh, Lamentations, the fourth chapter, verse 21, it says that this city was located near the area of Edom. So, let's begin. Let's begin to look at the text. I'd like to read... Oh, I want to summarize the five reasons if you'd like to write them down. Those are the five reasons uh, why uh, we're st studying the book. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to move to the next screen to continue, though. So, I'll, <laughs> I'll need to do that. I should have put it up sooner. Let's go to the text. The very first chapter, we're going to be looking at the entire chapter and the balance of our time. The first five verses, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 uh, donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people in the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their heart. This was Job's regular custom. The book then starts with a, a very good man, the best of the best. His characteristics were that he was blameless, he was upright, he feared God, and he shunned evil. That's a pretty good list, don't you think? That's the foundation for Job's character, that he feared God. In Psalm 111, verse 10, it reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. To fear the Lord means to respect who he is, what he says, and what he does. It's not a cringing fear of a slave before its master, but rather it's a loving reverence of a child before their father, a respect that leads to obedience. When I was a young man, I loved my father. And I had this kind of fear for him in the sense that I didn't want to disappoint him by my behavior. The threat of disappointing him was greater than the threat of punishment. I just didn't want to disappoint him. Such was Job. He did not want to disappoint God. He shunned evil. It's a commendable attitude to fear God. And it's one that God states that is true of, of, of Job. He validates this for in the first chapter of the eighth verse as well as the second chapter of the third verse, God says of Job, no one on earth like him. No one on earth like him. Best of the best. 
You will note in verse 2 and 3 that he had a great number of children. He, he had seven sons, three daughters. And he was blessed with wealth. His goodness had been blessed with prosperity, as many of you have been. Wealth in those days was measured by one's lands, animals, and servants. And he had an abundance of all three. But it didn't turn his heart away from God. He used it for the good of others. And we know that because in Job 29, 12, it, is, it says, Because I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist him. In other words, Job was careful to pay attention to the poor and to the orphan, the fatherless. He used his wealth in such a fashion. In verses 2 and 3 of this passage that we have in front of us, talks about Job's family life and his concern for him, for them. You see, his children must have enjoyed each other's company as they met frequently and to celebrate time together in the form of a feast. Perhaps not unlike our Thanksgiving celebrations when the whole family gets together and we celebrate. The fact that their father showed and offered a, a, a special sacrifice after each of these feasts shows that Job was a God-fearing man and he wanted to make sure that his family was right with God. Uh, the scripture says that Job offered burnt offerings when the feast had run its course just in case, just in case his children had sinned. What comes out then is his concern with the spiritual welfare of his children. A quick application. Dads, we have an obligation to provide for the physical needs of our children. But do you likewise have a burning concern for their spiritual state? It ought to cause us, like Job, to be in prayer daily for them as well. Then one day, out of the blue, he had a life reversal. And we'll move in the text down to verse 13 where it describes what happened. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let's, let's begin to read. At verse 13, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. <coughs> Excuse me. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties, swept down on your camels, and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped. To tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Right after each other. One afternoon, his life was turned upside down. They say troubles come in threes, not with Job, they came in fours. So much for Job's prosperity. It was gone in one afternoon. The most godly man in the East lost everything. What on earth is going on? Earth will never give you an answer, but heaven does. And thank goodness we have a heavenly perspective. Let's go back to verse 6. Let's back up and look at Job 6.13, and we'll look at the events prior to this disastrous day in the life of Job. We'll go to the very throne room of God. That's what makes this book so unique. It tells us 
behind the scenes what God was thinking and what God did. Let's read this passage. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And Satan went out from his presence and performed his deeds. This is an interesting passage because it starts by saying, One day the angels came to present themselves, and among these individuals, these angels, was one fallen angel that we refer to as Satan. And we're astonished to find that Satan, the pinnacle of evil, lurking in the divine court in front of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And it was God who said, Have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Satan's belief was that no one would serve God from pure motives. In his eyes, Job only serves God for what he can get out of it. <clears throat> In his eyes, then, he believes that humans are basically self-seeking, like he is. And Satan thought God had blessed Job greatly. No wonder he's happy to serve God. A quick personal application. The unbeliever today also will question your integrity as a Christian. We need to give him, be careful not to give him a reason to question our integrity. Nothing is accidental in that particular passage of Scripture with God. And so we can assume it was God who brung up the name of Job, Job because he was proud of him. Job, the most upright spiritual man of his day, loves God with all of his heart. And furthermore, I think that God handpicked Job to demonstrate to Satan how faithful some human beings can be. But as mentioned, Satan wasn't impressed. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? In effect, Satan was saying, Job loves you because all of the gifts you give him. Take away his gifts and he'll no longer love you. God accepts the challenge. And here is the test. And is the issue of the book of Job. Will it become obvious to all that Job values his possessions more than God? Or, will it be obvious to Satan that Job values God more than his possessions and his children? What will it be? That is the issue in the entire book of Job. Will it be obvious to Satan that Job values God more than his possessions and his children? God could have said, <clears throat> I don't need to prove anything to you, Satan. I know Job's heart, but rather he accepts this challenge. And we are privileged to know this inside information that started at verse 6 about the throne room of God. God had pronounced Job to be blameless in verse 8. Therefore, in reality, Satan's attack was on God. Satan's accusation against Job was really an attack on God. The only reason Job fears you 
is because you protect and prosper him. In essence, Satan was saying, God has to pay people to worship him. That didn't set right with God. Doesn't set right with you either, I don't suspect. And so we see the heart of Job becoming a battlefield of good and evil. The story of Job then is a story of a battle, as well as all scripture is. But throughout the Bible, we do not see God panic. <laughs> we see all kinds of activities in the Middle East that cause us to be concerned. God doesn't panic. He's not panicking because he knows who's going to win. Yes. This scene and a similar scene that we'll look at next week in the second chapter is never repeated again throughout the book. That's phenomenal. As Job and his friends struggle with this issue, when God finally speaks, never is the throne room shared with Job and its activities. So let's go back to earth. We looked at what occurred in heaven. We've seen what the issues are at stake. Will it be obvious to Satan that Job values God more than his possessions and his children? Let's look at Job's response. It's found in the 20th verse. At this, Job, and this, this narrative starts after all of the events. You remember we read the, what occurred. Uh, all of these messengers came and said, uh, and I am the only one that survived to tell you this. After receiving all of this bad news, this is Job's response. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Phenomenal response. A classic verse quoted so often. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You see, the ultimate and supreme, the ultimate value, the supreme glory, and the utter magnificence of Jesus Christ is shown when people see Him more valuable than any of their possessions. The beauty of Jesus is displayed more clearly, most clearly, when Christians treasure Christ more than they treasure what they're losing. That is an important statement, my friends. The beauty of Jesus is displayed most clearly when Christians treasure Christ more than they treasure what they're losing. Jesus Christ said, and Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Listen, listen. If you get into the face of God because of what's being taken away, you show where your treasure is. If you get into the face of God because of what He's taken away, you're showing where your treasure is. And that doesn't speak well to a world where we proclaim Him as our supreme treasure. And that is the big issue of the book of Job. Satan did not want it to be known that God is more valuable than anything that Job has. He desperately didn't want it to be known. He still doesn't want it to be known. And so the issue can be applied to our lives as well. The issue can be applied to our lives by asking the question, asking ourselves the question that is the title to our series. The title to our series is, How Will I Respond to Life's Reversals? Let's pray.
Father, you're our all in all. What do we have if we don't have you? Like one gentleman said earlier, we just won't watch the football game. No point being here, but you're more invaluable than a football game. You're more valuable than our possessions. You're more valuable than anything we have. If we lost it all today like Job and still had you, we'd have everything. Because you are everything. And we worship you today uniquely as we come and are going to be serving communion. We pray for these elements and we pray that they might speak to us as we continue to worship this morning. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.